to listeners, here we are again, another session of the AGS Airline Ground Services Digital Summit. Uh, I've got two great guests here today, uh, and the parties I'm talking about is firstly, Ola Takumbo Fagbemi. And uh, Ola Takumbo, thank you very much for allowing me to shorten um, your, your first name, which makes it a lot easier for me, but uh, I really appreciate that. Thank you. And Ola Takumbo is the Group Managing Director of Narco Avian. So lovely to have you on board. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you and um, good morning, Chris. And you can shorten my name anytime. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. And, and, and then we've got Miguel Gomez um, Sujun, Junison, who's the EVP Europe, Menzies Aviation. And uh, Miguel, I can just about get yours across the line, so I won't be calling you Mig. So thank you very much. And uh, welcome on board. No, thanks, Chris. No, thanks for inviting me. And, and it's a pleasure to be here. So looking right. forward to the chat. Great. Now, guys, um, what we're going to be talking about is lessons learned. You know, challenges have been overcome. And uh, but also the global respect of the supply chain has heightened our profile greater than than any time before and, and through any other incident or um, or, you know, or crisis. Uh, but how do we keep that going? How do we keep the momentum going? So we're going to be talking about, you know, what have we what have we learned? What's going to be new? What's going to be different? What should have been more focused upon? And um, we'll get into that. But before we do, can I ask each of you just to give a brief bio, um, just covering um, anything that you feel is interesting and also about your accountabilities and responsibilities at the moment. So if we can start, if we can start with you, please, uh, Takumbo. Okay, thank you, Chris. Um, I am the Group Managing Director of NACO, Nigerian Aviation Handling Company. Um, we are the leading handling company in Nigeria. Um, in that role, I'm in charge of actualizing the strategy of the board. We're a quoted company, um, developing strategies to move forward. My past life, I started life as a pharmacist. I did an MBA and then moved into aviation and pretty much done um, a lot of work consulting and working for airlines, um, the CAA airport. Um, I have uh, done the AMPAP. Um, I've worked in different spheres and lately NACO and that kind of puts everything together. And um, it's great to be here. Um, I've also tried as much as possible to be active in, AC, in um, ACI before and um, GHI. Attended some GHI uh, workshops. Um, started going for GHI sometime in the 2000, dropped off and then lately again, I haven't come back to NACO. And I'm happy for the forum and the network. Trust me, I've used it many times to get a lot of things when we stock and, and it, it's been great. And this last year indeed has been extremely challenging. Yeah. Um, should I go on on that or wait for me? No, 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 Will. That's that's great, but 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 well done and uh, and uh, what a great great background there. And um, it's it's. Uh, I'm just. I've got. I'm going to have to ask you now. What what made you want to get into into aviation after starting off in pharmacy and. I think I get, got into it by accident. <laughs> As I think we all did. We all did. That's and, uh, and it's very sticky. It, it just holds you on like and quicksilver. You you can go anywhere. Yeah, uh, that's that's it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's strange, isn't it? Huh? Once once you're in, you're in for always. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. And now Miguel. Yeah, so as you said, you know, I'm Executive Vice President for Menzies Aviation uh, for Europe. So I take care of all the European uh, business, in this case, with the exception of fuels, which is done by, by a colleague of, of mine. Uh, as my name would indicate, you know, I'm, I'm Spanish, but I was actually born in, in Sweden uh, to a Swedish mother. Uh, I was brought up in Spain. Uh, I went to university in the UK. Uh, so I studied business and, and environmental management in, in the UK. Um, but, you know, I've been in aviation all, all my career. You know, I started in the airport as a summer job. Um, and, you know, while I was doing my university studies and then, you know, after finishing university, it was, it's, you know, it was just a career. Been in Menzies since 2008. Uh, and I've been going through the ranks, you know, doing various roles. Started in Spain. Um, and then I went to Sweden in 2011 to manage the Swedish business. Uh, went on to manage the Scandinavian business and then continental Europe and more recently since since last November 
12 months ago, we incorporated the UK into the European business and, and I'm taking care of, of that also. Okay, very good, very good. I lived, I lived in uh, Sigtuna in, in Sweden and uh, also Madrid in Spain. So I was wondering how you got the balance of A, the name and also the, um, you know, the accents. And which, which university did you go to? So I did, I did my degree in, in Greenwich and I did my master's in Brighton. Okay, all right, yeah, no, very good. Well, lovely guys. Um, really, really appreciate your, uh, your, you know, you're coming on board. Now, what we're going to be talking about today, obviously, everybody. I mean, nobody, nobody doesn't know about COVID, but it's it dra drags everything down. You know, the way everybody always, always reflecting what happened, why this happened, etc. But the amount of lessons that globally have been learnt now as a result of this are phenomenal, and it's what are we now doing to influence, to inspire, and to introduce better outcomes with consumer needs in mind because that's also now a big issue because of the shortages of personnel and problems across all sectors and all industries so what i'd like to do first and foremost is and it's up to either one of you to start what what have really been the big big learnings for you and your organizations that have positively come out of this last 16 to 18 months So it's, it's easy for me to throw it to the two of you rather yeah, than... Yeah, yeah, just, just, just throw, throw one, one of us into it and we, we'll get that's it That's it, that's it, that's who, who it. Who wants to jump out first? Happy happy to go, uh, Chris, you know. So I think in, in terms of people, um, obviously, we, you know, it's been a bit of a roller coaster uh, when we started the pandemic. It was all about downscaling, getting the right number of people in the business uh, and then scale up again. But through the, through the whole process, um, obviously aviation is, is lost, is appealed to a certain extent um, because it was a, a very affected uh, business. And it is about, you know, making sure that we kept the engagement of, of, uh, of the team, good communication and, you know, those that, you know, were with us through through the whole process, making sure that we had a good, good engagement. And the engagement, it, it has been, you know, a lot about, communication and engagement, you know, from station managers, you know, being very close to the people and doing briefings, you know, on, on a daily and weekly basis to, you know, uh, for, for those that have not been able to travel, doing communications, uh, utilizing teams uh, and getting people updated through it. So, you know, the people part, key one, engagement and, and, and communication certainly been, you know, a big part. And obviously for those that, have, as I said, for those not being able to travel as much, Teams has been, you know, an absolutely uh, great tool that, you know, pre-COVID we haven't been really utilising too much and we've seen ourselves sort of forced into use it. And it's certainly a tool uh, that I'm sure all of us will be using a lot more going forward. Um, other lessons learned, obviously, from a, from a pure business perspective, um, I would say the need of being able to adapt uh, to the volume uh, has been absolutely clear. So, so I would say in terms of you know, our, our lease commitments that we have across the business from premises to, to equipment, you know, we're certainly looking going forward for more flexible models. Yeah. Um, and I would say also on the commercial side, you know, trying to do things again, you know, more, more uh, capturing that volatility of, of volume that we might see also going forward. Okay, thanks very much, Miguel. And, uh, and over, over to you, Jacumba. Yeah, um, not to repeat most of what Miguel has said, um, I would say it's one of the most challenging times that we've had as an organization and um, that we've been able to come out of it is the greatest lesson that we had. And we, we had to face um, just a material drop in our income by 70, 80%. Yeah. We're highly unionized. So um, having to work with the unions to manage that process. We couldn't just lay off people. We don't have that social safety net that they're going to get anything from. So we had to um, communicate, work with them, look at how best we could um, keep some people at home, pay a percentage of pay, keep people happy. Um, so we, communications was of great importance. We started to look at things, use our digital tools that we had, Teams, Zoom. In fact, we focused more on Zoom because Teams in the initial was using so much bandwidth and people in different areas yeah, did, yeah. could not use it. So um, Zoom was what we picked on and that helped us a lot. Then our internal team, IT team had to develop 
yes, they used to develop tickets, but now more tickets for so many things. So it's easy to trace what is happening, what is going on while you're at home. And uh, we engaged more also with our partners, the um, airlines that we serve because uh, it was pretty difficult for them. And in Nigeria, a lot of things didn't, it was tough. So the first thing was government said, we're gonna close the airspace. And, and so we had to walk up to them and say, if you close the airspace, then what happens to cargo? I mean, if you need the cargo to come in with the, what do you do? So after that, the certain criteria was set up, uh, which meant that it was difficult to manage. So if you had a, a flight to come in, you would have to take a permit. So the yep. schedules were not working and the airlines, had to come in and go out because there was nowhere for the pilots to stay. Practically, they had to stay on board. So that was a challenge, having to fix, you know, we're used to working with some bit of structure, the shuttle, and you can yeah, plan. Yeah. And then now you just have to do everything. So it meant that we had to be in communications 24-7 with everyone that was involved. And we had to keep a team on ground around the clock without going home, which was tough. And that has its own emotional um, side where we have to manage the team, support them, visit them though we're not supposed to visit, just to keep the core team, to keep their, their spirits up. So we had our engineering team, for example, broken into two. There was an on-site team that practically didn't go home for like six weeks and then we had people coming to support them. And you can imagine the kind of emotional pressure that had. Um, we also had to work with our regulators because things kept changing all the time, you know, yep. all the time. But what did that do? It gave a different view now. So we have a situation where before things would just be thrown at you, but now we have a lot more stakeholder engagement with the regulator, with government, when new issues are to come up, which is which is a good thing because then it's more interactive. You can all plan to to towards that, and the, and the cost savings, you know, to look at how do we do things differently because we don't have the money and we still need to do these things. So speaking to our, our suppliers, we also even coming out of COVID, we had equipment we had bought. And typically when we buy the equipment, the supplier has to come in, do a bit of training. So we had um, training being done online for some of the newer GSEs that we had just bought so that we'll be able to commission them because they were there. We had uh, some of our operatives who had to be trained and there was nobody coming in from Europe to come yeah. in to do that. So we had to think out of the box. We had other, we had a whole plan. We had worked out with one of our OEMs on coming to look at all our um, high loaders before that and kind of work out a whole maintenance plan. And there was nobody going to come in to go and do that. And yeah. so we did it in a cheaper fashion using Zoom, sending videos. We actually then cut the cost of them coming over and we were able to do it and, and, and we did work very well. And it's something that we continue to use. And the use of PPEs, you know, it's also a big expense where do you get the PPE from? It now becomes something that our procurement team has to plan for more, you know, more than before. And we have so many new rules now, different conjures with yep. what yep. you need to do. To, to you know, on, I'm just thinking to myself, I'm just thinking to myself, I asked you a question there and I, I can see now how enthusiastic and how much material you've got. So I, I appreciate that. Um, that's a huge amount of activities, and I know there's more to come. Yeah. I've got two. I've got two questions now. One for each of you, based on 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 a couple of the points that you've that you've raised. Mm -hmm. One for you. One for you, Takumba, which I'll come to shortly because you mentioned about the unions and about the flexibility and the pressures. But firstly, uh, Miguel, the one I'd like to ask you is with regards to the understanding and those early days of collaboration when everybody was thrown into the mix together. Um, your contracts and your SLAs, as we stand now, are carriers are carriers now a lot more supportive? Are they doing as much as they can? You know, understanding that they can't they can't hold um, hand and agents to like vo you know volume based contracts when there's you know there's such such you know you you can't you can't work out when the flights are coming in the schedules aren't there are they are they doing certain things and where there used to be penalties are they being a little bit more 
more open to changes. And then obviously with the Prater situation, there was so much more that was going on with, with cargo loading. So there's a lot of differences. Are they taking all that into consideration? Um, so a, a lot of a lot of points there. I would say, you know, there's this. Yeah, obviously, we have you know 500 carriers, uh, so you know everyone's acting differently, exactly. uh, and, and we do understand all of them. You know, from a volume base, th there are some carriers that fully comprehend, understand, and are, and are going in that direction. It does make things. It does make the discussion easier. Other carriers, obviously, you know, everyone wants to incentivize uh, and and generate demand. You know, and and by Having a high cost base, you know, it's harder for them to incentivize and, and generate that additional demand. So there's, it's a mi mixed bag, Chris. Some, some are really forcing and trying to get, you know, the same uh, pricing that, you know, you would have pre-COVID. Um, and, and, you know, obviously we certainly believe more in a volume-based approach, you know, sort of capturing the, the cost base that, that we have. From an SLA perspective, I mean, there, there has been you know more flexibility uh with with the challenges that we've all had um you know we've been confronted with so that there has been more flexibility there has been additional things thrown into the mix that we'd never contemplated contractually uh you know sort of passengers not having a, a passenger locator form on you know upon arrival is not something that you know we were confronted in the past it was about you know did they have the right passport visa etc and and there's certainly been quite a few discussions around those because it is a new a new procedure uh, something you know additional pressure for our gate agents to 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 check an additional check putting more pressure on them and and, and it's sort of a little bit harder to manage and control so we've seen it we've seen a, a um, a mix back uh, in, in the reaction of the airlines, obviously not, not a single airline has reacted in, in the same way. And that's been actually one of the, you know, operationally, it's, it's also been the same where, you know, uh, different airlines have reacted differently in terms of the procedures implemented for COVID. And that's been an additional challenge for our staff, not only having the constant regulation change, having to adapt and understand, you know, what passengers what passenger would need from doing one route and another, but then the different airlines changing their procedures uh, and having to adapt to those. So certainly a, a key key challenge for us to manage there. Okay, very good, thank you. And then the question for uh, for you, Jakunbo, mm -hmm. is you mentioned there about the the unions. Okay, now you know obviously you know the US, and then you've got you've got some some very heavily unionized mm -hmm. areas in Europe. So from experiences, but also. Having, having spent some time in Nigeria as well, I, I, I know how how um, how challenging and in some cases how necessary it has been there. But do you feel now that there's an understanding and that there's appreciation that perhaps individuals themselves can actually now influence one of the changes of the future by realising their own self-value, their own self-asset value um, of becoming more multi-skilled whether it be upskilling new skilling reskilling so that they can actually do more and be more flexible shall we say or agile um but one of the things that i'm 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 thinking of is ha having worked around the world and in some areas where extreme pressures and especially temperatures you know are differentiated if you can let people know and experience part of the process before their core responsibilities and part of the process afterwards so if you take, like I used to work with, with guys doing 12-hour shifts. Mm -hmm. So now that's a long time. It's a long time to be on the ramp. It's a long time to have physical activity, and especially in extreme conditions. Do you think there's an opportunity now for us as an industry to sort of say, right, well, we've got a 12-hour shift, but we're going to do eight hours is the physical side, and then you've got two hours at the front where you're assisting in pre your own activity, whether it be administration uh, and the same at the other end, and that they could actually be used fluidly, um, whether it between general ramp, whether it be with cargo handling, so that they're able to adapt to peaks and troughs. And if you had a multi-skilled sort of like task force or SWAT team, that their, their remuneration should be higher than others who, who don't either feel the need or don't have the capability or don't want to have that upskilling. Do you think there's possibilities now where, you know, everybody's looking at things differently now mm -hmm. and to have more of a career and to, to you know, to, to let people know that, you know, even though aviation has been hit within the supply chain, it's still critical. And whilst there's been layoffs, et cetera, it will come back. But if you come back stronger with it, you know, you've got a better career opportunity. 
Yeah, I think that uh, multi-skilling is, is always a good thing, but doing it on the ramp, you've got to be very careful because of so many um, safety and quality issues. Yep. And you really have to be um, well planned. You also have different airlines that have different products, even on the ramp, the way different people do their load sheets are all different. And we find out that um, a lot of our airlines in Nigeria are very jealous of, oh, this is... Uh, this person is my staff. So we have started a program, which actually started pre-COVID, speaking to all the different airlines to say, look, what we're going to give you is a base team. And around that base team, we want some flexibility so that we can use our staff easier. And it's also better for them because they have a future. They, have, they, they can aspire to be different things, you know, and it's taking COVID actually for some of the airlines to understand what what we mean and we have some coming up to say look you gave us this idea let's see how we're going to work on it this is what we're going to do we even have some airlines dropping what is called in their own special way to say look these things are based on standard principles so yes yes exactly so so it's, <clears throat> it's taking COVID to help um to see that better but i would like to say that it's not all the airlines that are buying into this. Some are still stuck on my people are my people, my products are my products. I don't want people moving across the ramp. I don't want somebody going from the ramp and then becoming a checking clerk. I just want this person to stay here for the next 30 years and just serve me this way. So we, we, we're working on that. And um, COVID has helped with some of the skeptics that didn't believe in it. And yeah. we hope that the others will be able to um, come on board. Good. Now, and, and you mentioned there about standards. One of the things, one of the things that, that you said, I, I just, and I still cannot believe it. In all the years I've been in this industry, some of the things have changed. So IGOM, ICHM, they were created for consistency and standards. And then one of the basic, one of the basic is, uh, items that's always used is the cones. How on earth can you have so many different, different understandings or requirements for cones layout? You know, it, it, for me, it, it's crazy. And, and I, used to, I used to sit on the ICHC, so we created the ICHM, to try and standardise and simplify things, and still you get people doing it. Now, the question, now a question following on from both of those to you both is, do you not think now that one of the one of the catalysts for change or the the positive disruptors could and should be an airport who is responsible for their own ecosystem and all of the members that operate within it to actually now start to standardize things and and insist that anybody coming into that airport anybody operating from that airport did things in a certain way and all the same way so the things that you've both mentioned there could be accommodated and additional things that I'm talking about is imagine in the future if you had an airport who had a group of multi-skilled like a SWAT team or task force so when some of their carriers coming in needed certain things etc you had a ready-made resource there that you tapped into the airport for uh, you know more effective pooling because luckily I've been traveling quite a bit myself lately and and I think it's because of COVID that you listen to people on the on the transfer buses more, you know, and especially if you're going to a remote stand and you and you hear them say, "My God, why are we going so far?" and the sustainability point comes across, and then they say, "Look at the amount of equipment that's there." Then others are saying, "Look how dirty the equipment is." Others are saying, "My God, why do they need so much equipment?" And then it comes down to the, you know, that's why we pay what we pay, etc. So you've got that never-ending that never ending cycle of, of frustrations because of what people see without them knowing what goes behind it. So the, just to, just to consolidate again, the big question is, do you now think that airports have got a much bigger part to play and they could play a much bigger part if they addressed all of these items and the industry itself started to self, you know, self discipline itself to say, my God, how silly were we, because there's going to be generations to come who are going to look back on this, and they're going to be analysing it, and they're going to say, my God, why did they do that? So whoever wants to jump in there, feel free. Happy, happy to go first, uh, Chris, if that's OK. I, I think that, you know, obviously pooling is, is certainly much more efficient than, you know, sort of different handlers having having their own equipment, especially in airports where you have, you know, five, six, seven 
seven handlers and you know you, you have parking spaces that are totally congested um, and then there's the environmental piece you know um, the one that really does my head in is is the, the busing you know where you know busing is done by the, by the you know individual handlers and you see you know fleets of, of, of buses you know where, where you, you know you just need amounts of space to park it and there are you know expensive pieces of equipment yep. you know not, not the most environmentally friendly piece of equipment uh, to be honest and those in my eyes should be actually it should actually be an airport activity altogether not not a grand handling activity which you know in many airports it is and you see the efficiencies com coming out of it you know it, it, it does make a lot more sense it, you know you talked about you know the the consistency in terms of procedures from airlines you know the certain you know it, it would be it make it would make sense to have you know the chocking and coning it could be an airport policy not yeah. only need the equipment be provided by the airport but you know obviously different airports different environments you have more wind or more ice or snow in different environments and you should have you know chocks and cones for that specific environment and the procedure should be for that environment and for us it'll be a lot easier to then train our staff in a single site on a single way rather than what we do today which is you know we, we have credo cards you know with all the chocking and coning procedure or you or we'll have the posters out you know just before you come out the break room with you know all the different policies and procedures so you know, without a doubt and i think you know obviously coming out of covid uh, uh, and we see we just had the the the, the uh, cop 26 is you know it is the environmental piece which is going to take a massive uh, importance and and you know it is certainly centerfold of our strategy uh, to to uh, become carbon neutral and you know that is certainly an easy way you know to tackle the environmental piece it is it is changing you know the the regulations on on diesel equipment making them uh, electric and you know where possible you know uh, going into a pool although having said that in certain airports you know by certain handles it is a competitive advantage you know to have certain pieces of equipment that can differentiate yeah. um, you know so certain handlers will will make more investment in, in piece of equipment than others and sometimes it is you know uh, a differentiator mm -hmm. Yeah, and all, but yeah, but at the moment there's a it's a conundrum with, you know, the three P's: people, profit, and planet. Mm -hmm. And everybody at the moment is in a phase where they all want to talk about sustainability and talk about what you should, must, and and have to do, without realizing that you know if you're not making money, it's very difficult to start investing in things that are going to benefit the planet. So there's a balance, and I think we're going to go through a couple of years where you know that that balance is going to be a hard thing to find. And equally, even if everybody wanted to go electric. The majority of airports couldn't handle it, so it's not a realistic option. Absolutely, I think one one of the challenges that we have, where we are trying to, you know, re invest in electrical equipment, are you know the lack of infrastructure from airports where they don't have the capacity or the infrastructure to be able to um, go electric. You know, we're, very recently we were acquiring electric equipment in 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 an airport in the UK, and and we couldn't because the infrastructure was not there, and you know we did put a lot of pressure. To make sure that it was there because it didn't make sense to these days buy you know sort of a high loader and have that high loader for the next 15 years uh you know sort of burning burning diesel or or, or whatever the fuel might be in in the, yeah. the lifespan of it you know yeah no exactly and and um and uh to Kumbo, um from your perspective with regards to you know airports being able to influence and do things to make things a lot simpler because, you know, and you, you just look at IGOM, et cetera, and look at some of the things that we've spoken about. It's been years and years and years, and regulatory bodies, representative bodies haven't managed to, you know, to calm things down and dilute things and make it easier for the group. And yet the industry now is talking so much about collaboration and data sharing. Now more than ever, we need to do things simpler so that we can focus on the critical elements of the business. I couldn't agree with you more that um, pooling and um, sharing infrastructure would be good. Um, we have a very, we don't have enough. So, I mean, so we, we've we had to form what is called an association of brand handlers of Nigeria. Yeah. And looking at how we can begin to pool because we have airports, for example, that have maybe four or five flights in a day and there are two handlers there. And both handlers have equipment, and we, it's not sustainable. Yeah. And we yeah. can't charge the airlines can't even pay the cost of running the business. 
So we've had to sit back to, we've not, we've gone uh, not as far as we plan to, because like Miguel said, sometimes the competitive forces come to play and, but early this year, we've started to work out and say, look, let's leave this competition and agree the areas in which we'll start the process and, and we'll move on. We, we, we can't go as green as you can in Europe. We don't have that infrastructure. We don't even have enough power to run some things. So basically we've been using green inside the warehouse just like any other person. Um, but we, we plan to begin to buy some tractors that are green. However, we are mindful of the fact that we don't have enough power the yeah. airport is not, uh, the airports are not built that way to be able to do that. But outside of us, I think that for us to be able to achieve this, we have to, um, the airports, the airlines and the grand handling companies have to, uh, on the different spaces, standardize things, then come together because of the interactions that come between the three groups. So that if I run as an airline, I want to think about an airline now and why would I want something done a certain way or just make it simple like that yeah. in terms of my, it's because I want to go everywhere, close my eyes and expect it to be that way. But the reality is, Miguel raised the point where yeah, if you're in the desert, it's different from if you're on the hills. Yeah. If we, if each group works together, ACI, IATA, JH, and then we all come together, then it's going to be easier to work out something that works across as much as possible for, for everybody. And that's the kind of thing that we are doing locally in, in Nigeria to try and ensure that we bring some sense into the equipments that are scattered all over in some areas where in some areas we don't even have enough equipment because in an airport that has only four or five flights yep. handlers, you have enough, one handler already has enough. And then in another airport like Lagos that is very busy and things can turn around, you don't have enough. So we need to withdraw those that are in the remote airports and bring those assets to full use in the busy airports. And that's what we are working on. I mean, COVID has pushed us to this level where everybody knows that we have to manage our costs. The time yep. for waste is gone. Yeah, no, you're 100% there. <clears throat> and, and just to add on a point that you've made there, um, the disparity in the use of some equipment in some airports, and especially now that some airports are coming out with arbitrary guidelines or, or restrictions that says if a piece of equipment has over so many years, it's, wow. got be, it's got to be taken out by such and such a time. Well, some of the equipment I've seen and, and experienced have been responsible for, it only has to move a couple of hundred yards every every time because you've got the stand so close. So that 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 use or that time period doesn't really make sense. So are you guys are you guys rotating, you know, heavy use equipment so that you get longer time out of it and lower use equipment you're bringing into more more um, you know high tempo areas? Are you do are you doing things like that? Yeah. We, we do that for some of our high loaders, especially when we started with the praters and we just, we, we didn't have enough high loaders to be, to, um, to handle the flights and the flights were coming in, all of them, passenger flights needing more high loaders. And so we had those high loaders, we had to look at them. We found out that one or two were always breaking down. We, we also have other peculiarities, uh, which uh, you have the airport, have a cargo section and have a passenger se section. But sometimes they just move you back and forth. You have to move equipment back and forth. So we've had to look at the equipment and do exactly what you said and keep some in the high traffic area focused on that, not moving anywhere, but just focused on doing those activities and others in areas of lower pressures and need. And so far, um, it's not 100%, but it's working. Okay, thank you, thank you, thank you very much for that. And Miguel, um, your point on that, and also also what I'd like to ask you as well, Miguel, is on, on incidents, because with so many people being laid off for so long, whether it's furlough, people not coming back, the brain drain, et cetera, mm -hmm. it would be fair to assume that like anything, even if you don't ride a bike, for a long time or if you've been driving on the left side or the right side and then you then you drive somewhere else as soon as you get in it, it it feels alien and you're not you're not as familiar as you used to be so 
are you seeing incidents happen more? Is fatigue coming in? Pressures, you know, um, um, Tukumbo mentioned there about emotional stresses and pressures, and there's been so much emphasis around the world from, you know, especially from the press about, you know, mental anxieties and mental issues and, and all of these things, which if they keep pushing it that way, people are going to self-diagnose themselves and feel worse. That's just my opinion. But, um, you know, I, what, what's being done differently and what are the realities there? So, so just on, on, on the piece, just following on from, from, um, from the Kumbo on, on the equipment side, um, you know, we've, we've certainly moved a lot of equipment, but, you know, not, not really looking at where we utilize the equipment most uh, or, or least and sort of turning those around. But obviously after or during COVID, you know, downscaling the equipment, we have moved equipment from, you know, places where, where we need it to, to places where you know, we're not utilizing. I don't think we've ever moved so much equipment in such a short period of time, uh, you know, because the utilization of, of, of the volumes in certain places have, you know, been yeah. so different that we've had to react on that front, you know, and being, being agile in, in terms of what we need where. So it is, it has been quite an interesting uh, uh, piece in terms of the, the the safety part and and you know the number of incidents you know happy to say that for us we have seen in proportion uh, less incidents you know sort of uh, 2021 um, we did see a trend however you know the incidents that we did have on the investigations you know we we did see a trend and 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 uh, a correlation uh, with a distraction of staff you know uh, having their mind elsewhere. Uh, with with you know everything that was going on, obviously I don't think anyone's been so much on top of the press, you know, during the COVID uh, era. Uh, everyone's been extremely affected, you know, f uh, financially, emotionally. So we did see a trend that you know, so people were more distracted, um, and it has been about you know, so was what I was saying earlier. It is about communication, ra raising the awareness of the staff, making sure that they're focused when they come to work um and you know sort of did doing some simple actions you know we did some credo cards um with with you know with our own um safety golden rules that we distributed to to all our staff so just a lot of focus on the awareness because we did see it you know we did see a trend that the reasons behind having the incidents that we had was was on, on people being distracted and having their you know sort of their mind elsewhere from where, where their body was, you know, very, very much distracted, which was very, very, very much understandable. So, but I'm, I'm happy to say that, you know, uh, at least for us, that the number of incidents has been low, you know, um, we were certainly very concerned coming into the year because uh, I think we started January on, on the wrong foot, you know, 1st of January, we had a, a grand damage. Uh, we had a uh, personal injury, you know, a few days later. So we started January this year with, with, you know, sort of alarm bells. Um, but, you know, I think the, the teams have done a great job, you know, doing that piece on raising the awareness. Um, and we have had, you know, a very good record this year, which I'm, I'm, I'm happy to say. Yeah, no. All right. Good, good, good. And, and to Kumbo, you know, you mentioned about now the additional pressures. Do you think now that, um, you know, one of the areas, I mean, one of the areas that wasn't as as well, I don't think as well versed as it could and should have been was, you know, risk assessments and having a, a plan B, a plan C, or even at times now a plan D, which is going to make people a lot more focused on continuity and contingency moving forward. But also on the way we train and, and the, the different now type of leadership or oversight that's necessary, you know, do you think that we should be looking at how to modify that rather than stick with the standard training and, and where i'm coming from is you you've both you've both appreciated that the conundrum that everybody's facing at the moment is we've got to do more with less we've got cost pressures but there's also more that people need to be aware of so one of the exercises that i did during uh, lockdown with 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 a few colleagues was we looked at the the best training course that we could remember attending and we took the, we took the curricula out and then we, we gave three dates, three months, six months, nine months. The objective after the three months was to open it, but not look at it and write on a piece of paper, what did we remember from what we considered to be the best training course we'd ever been on? And it was, it was, it was a hugely high percentage. It was almost 60% to way over 70% that we all forgot. So then when we realized what we forgot, the second date of the six months was to see now that, you realize what was covered, what would you then want to put in that was important to the role that you were carrying out? Mm. Okay. 
And that was also quite low because it was around, 20, I think it was 20 something to just over 30%. And then the final marker, which was after nine months was now that you've done those exercises and you looked at it from a, from a holistic overview perspective, purely because of the cost pressures and the impact what after nine months would you actually want to put into your next year's strategy plan or key activity and why? And that for us was between five and 12, five and 15%. So then we asked the question, if you were in procurement or a manager who was having to pay out for his training budget, why would you spend so much time taking people away from the workplace and, and um, having them forget so much and also do a memory test after they attended the course instead of doing something different, which was focused on the impact on the business and more practical. Do you think there's an opportunity without criticizing any training regime, any training program, because they're separate entities and they all, when you look at them, very professional, mapped out beautifully. They've got an awful lot of, of, of areas of focus. And I should do some training myself. And once you got the, if it was regulatory, once you got the, the regulatory criteria, the headlines, mm -hmm. you then either padded that out or you went into as many examples with the participants as you could, etc. So there's a differential layer as to, you know, how much is necessary, how much is overdone, what could you do offline, what should people be doing, you know, when they're on site. And then the question of when do you do that, that competency verification? Because if it's done directly after an exercise, all you're doing is teaching people how to check their memory of what they've just done and focused on rather than retention of knowledge or impacts of that knowledge. So I'm not asking you to change the whole training regime, but do you think there's an opportunity for, for that? And then I've got a question for you, Miguel, on biometrics. Okay, so, so for us, um, what we've done is we've looked at training differently because... Do, we started that just before COVID and during COVID, we couldn't do the recurrency of, for a lot of people. And we also needed to train people that were coming back to work. And there yeah. had to be a program for training people who were in diverse spaces and we needed to train them and were still trying to maintain social distancing and all that. So we started to invest in um, training using digital methods. And that meant that we had to go back to the curriculum itself because the way you're going to train using virtual is different from when you train face-to-face. -face. Yep. So that was the first thing that we've started and we're still going on, we haven't finished. Then what the other thing is from incidents and ha accidents that happen, we have learning points and we had we were gathering all those learning points and nothing was being done with them. So we picked all those things like common mistakes that people make on the ramp, mistakes, and we're putting it back into the training also. So that the training is not just um, what we've, what the curriculum says, what we've agreed with the CAA, what we've agreed with the airline, but it's also kind of practical so that we can have a pr practical approach. We also have... Um, I can't remember what we call it, but it's on the training where every, um, the SOP yeah. that we have, we have each team as much as possible on their own, the team leads take different elements and get different people within the team at any level to come up and, and chat about what they knew about that element. And we started that and found out that it wasn't being done properly. So we had to challenge the quality team to, as part of what they do to check that it's being done. And this is kind of informal. So you can pick a ramp assistant and just ask them about things about how do you label, how do you check um, when you want to um, load the, the different um, containers. And yep. you just maybe calls out a few of the um, airport co um, codes and it's fine. I mean, he knows that. So depending on the team, so there's a lot of flexibility. So we're doing things outside the classroom more and seeing that by the time you now go for your recurrency, you still need to be, be current. We've also changed our whole curriculum for those that are coming in because we want to multi-skill so that part of the training takes you through different elements of the whole process when you come in. Whenever you have a recurrency, we also have 
uh, redone uh, the curriculum so that different elements are taken. But the challenge that we have is with all these things that we're doing, we don't have enough trainers. So now we're now having to look at how do we train the trainers because you change the curriculum. Lots of people have left because of COVID. We lost trainers to many airlines. So we have this beautiful plan. Then we still have to work on the trainers also. Yep, yep, yep. No, it's a tough one. And it's also, it's also you know, there's... Um, so I was on, on a workshop a couple of weeks ago and um, the, the, the same issues came up about the train the trainers. And um, one of the things that we did was we put less emphasis on the old train the trainer concept where they, they went through as a formal trainer. And we looked more on coaches or individuals who are identified as being the best at a particular part of that uh, exercise. So they might not have been people who wanted to be trainers or wanted extra responsibility, but because the management and the peers identified them as being the best at a certain issue, we then did a little exercise to see if we could encourage them to do things. And, and for some, it opened up their minds a little and it gave them an opportunity maybe to look at doing things differently in the future. So I think I think everybody now is looking at is looking at things differently. And and uh, Tukumbo, I, th I thank you for that. And now um, something perhaps you might also like to think about, but for you, Miguel, um, fatigue. Okay, now fatigue comes from various influences and various different factors. And for some, it could be the stress of what's going on outside of work and lack of sleep. Others, it could be that they have several jobs. I, I, I lived in the States as well. And, you know, some of the guys I used to play football with and stuff, you know, when we'd finish, they'd go off and do a, they'd go off and do a late shift when they'd already done an early shift with the company that I was working with. And you'd say, my God, how can you have the energy or the, the focus? So depending where you are, there's different, different influencing factors. But the one thing that our industry, thank God, touch wood, um, is so good at is safety and security and we're it's an incredible industry and incredible people like yourselves who are responsible for it um, but with biometrics now being so advanced would you be adverse to having something that was in the cabin or in the cockpit of some real heavy expensive material but also that can cause so much damage of having that as the ignition, shall we say, that you had a facial scan and God forbid if there was something wrong, maybe high temperature or, and I'm not talking high temperature now for COVID, I'm talking about, you know, um, a high temperature that would affect fatigue or that there was other stress levels that could be read from it, which is possible now, that that would be the way that those vehicles had the ignition on. Because in the past, we've had the smart cards, but you can, you can get a colleague or a friend to put their card in which says, yes, I'm trained, yes, I'm this, yes, I'm that. You've got the fingerprint, which, again, somebody can just lean in and put the fingerprint on. But if this was now something that was purely you, okay, now where I'm coming from is in lots of areas, the organisations themselves are under so much pressure that they offer people excessive amounts of overtime, they ask them to do things quicker, faster, and that in turn you know, lets down the duty of care to the individuals. So to you first, Miguel, and then if you can think about it, uh, to Kumbo, do you think that that biometric opportunity is something that would be taken up or would be adv advantageous? So so just to understand you, Chris, you're saying a biometric that would be able to read your, your if, if you've got a high fatigue level. Um, yeah, yep, yep. yeah. fatigue, stress, um, you know, that there were maybe something else that was not, not quite right because it, it can, there is systems now that can do it. I've, yeah, I've, I've been looking at them. I mean, excuse my ignorance and on, on the matters, I was not aware that, 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 you know, they're, they're already out there, but I think it's a, it's a fantastic idea. If, you know, if, if there is a system that will be able to, to read, you know, fatigue, uh, and will be able to exclude, uh, you know, the individual from taking a task, which is high risk, you know, not putting not only an, an aircraft at risk, but himself and his colleagues at risk, then, you know, for, for sure something, you know, we would be looking into it. I mean, we currently have time and attendance systems, um, yeah. you know, which are biometric, but would, 
with the only thing that's telling us is when people come to work and leave work and we're, we're able to generate automatic reports on when people are exceeding the, the you know, uh, the number of working hours they sh they, they're supposed to do. Uh, so it's something that, you know, we do generate in, in, in many locations, especially when we starting having issues with, uh, you know, attrition, et cetera. So, I mean, we monitor closely to make sure that we, we're, we're compliant. The, the, the difficult part there is is knowing you know what they're doing outside of work you know in terms of have they got two jobs you know we've seen this in the likes of of Spain when you know it's a very seasonal yeah. uh, uh, seasonal work and people try to do you know sort of cover the, the income they need for the full year with two or three works you know during during a four five six month period so that, that's difficult to control but but biometrics to you know read fatigue I mean so, sounds good I'm sure the first reaction of certain uh unions might be a negative one you know when we introduced time and attendance through biometrics you know there was a a lot of resistance from from the unions and i think we you know in the 11 countries in europe that we're in now probably most of them you know were, were adverse to it and and now we utilize uh it's a normal thing i think with the exception of of france and uh, we use biometric everywhere so i'm sure the first there will always be you know that first reaction from the unions of of, of change but um i, I can't see anything wrong from a you know gdpr etc that that you know would yeah and, it, and it's hold us from it so it's 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 an additional barrier you know to utilize so i'm not sure how effective they are but if they are i think it's a fantastic idea yeah, yeah and it's also it's also to help the individuals because you know you imagine as a family and you lose somebody you know there's no amount of unionized reasoning or people's resistance to certain things that would say okay you know, well, you know, that could have been avoided. Why, why wasn't it? You know, yeah. and I think, I think now with what's happened, um, you know, and even, even now, you know, in, in certain areas, you know, the, the people are starting to look at, you know, no jab, no job, you know. And, I was just going to say that, Chris, you know, this is, this is sort of from, from a, you know, duty of care perspective, we were having this conversation just yesterday with, with part of the regional teams within Europe, you know, um, it, just about how do we, how do we manage the COVID piece? You know, so obviously, we are seeing there's no jab, no job, and it's like, what direction do we take? You know, we certainly want to to make make sure that we have safe working uh, places, and and you know that it doesn't happen on our watch where someone can get infected at work and and someone might pass away. You know, and and we haven't done all in our hands to to you know to protect our employees. Yeah. Um, so so yeah, it's, we've got a duty of care. So if this if this tools out there you know that can support us you know uh, to mitigate incidents you know. We have that that duty of care, and and we should we will certainly look into it and, and and implement. You know, if something happens and you you don't feel that you've done everything at hand, you know, you're gonna feel you know terribly about it if there's a severe incident. So exactly, and I, and I think now's the time for everybody, everybody, to start caring more about everybody else because it's not just about yourself and what happens to you; it's what you can do for others or to others. And I think everybody now, you know, this is this is the time now, you know, without getting too biblical or too deep, but it's the time now for people to start caring more about others because that's the best way to to move forward. All right, thank you for that, Miguel and and um, uh, Tukumbo. Um, what do you think? You know, I, I know with the unions and everything there, but you know, if it's to help people and protect people, um, and it and it's part of a duty of care or a wellness or a well being promotion personally i'd love to have it even if you know even if it was there for myself you know to find out what my normal was and and work out why there was excursions from that normality yeah i think it's a, it's a useful tool and um, already in some areas we take your temperature before you come in and um, the biometrics if you work the greatest thing for us would be uh, the cost but anything that would aid people because right now we noticed um, that a lot of our staff were having elevated blood pressure. Yeah. So one of the things we keep doing is encouraging them to um, to go do a check. We have a clinic around, and uh, we we see that it helps. We actually even wanted to go as far as to um, get some blood uh, pressure check stands, but then the issues of liability, what do you do when, you know, so we step down on that. So we're heavy on how best we can help people in terms of their health, because it's only healthy people that can deliver the kind of results that we want and nobody wants um, things to happen. It's, COVID has opened us 
more to look at the um, health of our staff more than before COVID. You know, yeah. and so it's a useful tool, and uh, if it yeah. exists at the right price, uh, we won't mind. Um, we will definitely uh, buy into that, but we would also look at other things that we can use to help people as much as possible. Yeah, and, and what you said there about the blood pressure, blood pressure, heart rates, you know, arrhythmias, all these, all these different issues that, you know, I think organisations now have got the opportunity to say, look, you know, this is a complete package. This is here to, 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 you know, to make you more aware of your own wellness and well-being. And as long as it's directing people to want to then make a decision for themselves or want to follow it up, that's as much as an employer can do. Um, but yeah, okay. Right, now, just want to say one last thing before we finish. If there was something very quickly that you could wish for within the next nine months, what would it be? And, um, and then nothing comes for free in this world. What would your commitment be towards that wish? So it shows that you're not just wanting others to do it, but you'd also want to do it yourself. So whichever one of you would love to come up. And as we're getting near Christmas, it's the time for wishes and, and commitment. So um, who'd like to go first? I'd be happy to go first, Chris. I guess, I mean, so two things that spark to mind. Uh, obviously, COVID has turned, you know, the, the, the world upside down. So I, I couldn't wish anything more than for COVID to disappear and be long gone um so that that you know that's certainly the first thing that that comes to mind and and we touched base on it you know so we we are looking at our policies on on you know on covid and what we need to do in in all locations to ensure that our personnel are, are covid free uh and you know we we have uh given out bonuses to staff to encourage uh, vaccination where people have not been uh, vaccinated and we're doing the same you know now with with the the flu jab so that would be our commitment you know we we incentivize people to get uh, to get jabbed and I'm, I'm happy to do that you know and, and hopefully that helps you know get rid of the this this uh, disease that's had you know so much impact the other one is is you know it's hard for me having studied you know environmental management and and sort of the you know the environmental piece being you know, in the centre of our strategy and being such an important uh, issue now coming out of COVID that, that it's, you know, finally got enough awareness out there. It, it is, you know, to have a sustainable future for our kids uh, and, and, you know, making sure that we have that focus on becoming carbon neutrals, you know, and, and you know, not only Mensa is fully committed, it, but, you know, I've got, I would say I've got a green heart and fully committed to making sure that we make the investments on on changing our equipment to electrical and, and becoming carbon neutral. So, you know, I want to see, you know, making sure that we don't reach those, you know, 1.5, 2 degrees uh, increase uh, on, on the globe. And we'll certainly do all in our hands, you know, to make sure that doesn't that doesn't get there and we can turn this around. Yeah. yeah. All right. Good, good. Thank you very much, Miguel. And, uh, and over, over to you, Chukumbo. Yeah, um, that's a nice thing from Father Christmas, Chris. <laughs> so um, over the next nine months, I mean, for me as a Nigerian first, to see our economy, I mean, take um, better shape and with some more stability so that it's, um, it's easier to plan, you know, and um, um, the COVID impacts, I I feel that now it's, it's here, so we should all move away and see how do we move forward, staying healthy and ensuring that the impact is as minimal as possible. Um, also for us, is we've, we've had an issue where the airlines in Nigeria were beating our heads and we've had to come up to say, look, we, these charges are not going to work. Uh, pitting one um, grand handler against another grand handler and building our heads to reduce the prices. And so um, we've started a regime working with the CAA on what is called um, a safety um, threshold charge, as much, which is the minimum. And uh, I would like over the next nine months for it to actually work and so that we can we can get value for what we're delivering and we can do it properly yeah hopefully that um, the business will grow just more stability and of course for us more equipment it's, it's, it's a tough issue and better understanding from the airlines and if the airlines do better we do better so also i wish that the travel industry does bounce back properly it's a, we've seen a lot of improvement but 
to what was predicted maybe um, five years ago, if it's possible. Yeah, yeah. That would be good. Yeah, that would be nice if, if Christmas could bring that to us all this year. But um, I think I think we're you know we're on we're on the mend, and and the better we are, and the and the more we learn to live with what we've got to face, uh, you know, then there's going to be more success. But listen, guys, thank you so much for joining us. It's people like you that have promoted the supply chain, and uh, you know made it made it appear how important it actually is in the eyes of the world. Because you know without all those all those wheels of, of effort and, and uh, you know, support and commitment and enthusiasm and engagement, you know, that it would have been an awful lot worse. So thanks very much for everything that you and your organisations have done. Well done and really appreciate your time with us.